In 120 years of cinema, there have been a handful of standout years that's collective body of work forever changed the landscape of motion pictures. For example, 1999 is an extraordinary year in which thought-provoking, visually mind-bending special effects, along with over-the-top action and groundbreaking independent films, grip cineplexes around the world. But it would be the cinematic universe films, started by the Star Wars prequel, The Phantom Menace, that will set the stage for the coming 20 years of cinema. There are a handful of other groundbreaking years, such as 1977's visual effect juggernaut films, or the 1967 culture shock films. But it all began at the sunset of the golden age of Hollywood, just before the dawn of the Second World War, 1939. Hollywood did all it could to entertain a naive, movie-going American audience. The seamless marriage of color, sound, and visual effects to create an epic, sprawling fantasy, The Wizard of Oz, which is still a cinematic marvel today. Color in cinema was experimented as early as 1904, utilizing mostly red and green color process. Blue was added in the late 1920s, but it was not until the development of the technicolor process and camera in the mid-1930s that we see the true potential of cinema. Natalie Kalmus was the sole technical advisor for technicolor in Hollywood, making her one of the most influential and powerful individuals in the story of cinema. Involved in hundreds of films throughout the 30s, Kalmus's influence is so profound, she is able to change Dorothy's silver shoes to ruby red to feature the color spectrum of red against yellow. The munchkins are happy because you have freed them from the wicked witch of the east. The technology came at a price. Blistering hot sets, at times over 100 degrees, was required to capture enough light for processing. Camera tricks, such as painting this room and talent, bronze, was required to create the special effect of sepia tone to vivid color. The heavily anti-populist live-action fantasy adventure would launch the career of Judy Garland. The complete opposite to The Wizard of Oz is the story of a young, tall, thin, vivacious Jimmy Stewart in the deeply political and social commentary film Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I can promise you one thing. I'll do nothing to disgrace the office of the United States Senate. This highly charged and controversial political drama shines a much needed spotlight on the deplorable relationship between the rich and politicians. They don't have to worry about being re-elected or anything else. They're smart. They take my advice. You mean you tell these men and Senator Payne what to do? Oh, yes. And Joe Payne has been taking my advice for the past 20 years. A subject equally important in the modern political landscape today. The film fired up senators and lawmakers in Washington, attacking Hollywood for slander. The story of an everyday man, Jimmy Stewart, seemingly naive, is selected by billionaires for his popularity and ease in which they believe he can be railroaded into following their illegal plans. Yes, sir, like a Christmas tiger, he'll nod his head and vote. Yes, yes sir. <laughs> You're not a senator. You're an honorary stooge. The film tackles the corrosive nature of corrupt journalism and the power billionaires, whom own the media, actually have. <laughs> well, see, the funniest thing you ever saw, that ranger never knew what struck him when Jim Taylor opened up on him. Well, which one of you girls wants this? In the end, director Frank Capra's masterpiece features the unconstitutional Civil War relic, the filibuster. All this stuff I've been telling you about this land you live in is a lot of hoot. This isn't your country, it belongs to a lot of James Taylor. Mr. Smith's final plea for decency in the last minute of the film finds a conscience. Every word that boy said is the truth. Every word about Taylor and me and Graft and the rotten political corruption of my state. Every word of it is true. I'm not fit for office. A classic, golden age of Hollywood ending, whose timeless storyline speaks volumes then as it does today.
of Mice and Men, co-written by Pulitzer Prize-winning author John Steinbeck about the Dust Bowl and Depression era, when high poverty and racism led to low morale and trust was tough to come by. Because I'm black. They play cards in there, but I can't play because I'm black. Everybody's gone to town. Masterfully performed by Burgess Meredith, Betty Fields, and Lon Chaney Jr. A deeply powerful film, dealing with the real-life effects of mental health in a time of no social awareness, care, or resources. Suppose they catch him. They bring him back, strap him down, and lock him up in a cage. That ain't no good, George. I know. By the late 1930s, John Ford struggled to find any studio interested in his sprawling Western epic, especially due to the fact he insisted the film star a virtually no-name John Wayne as outlaw Ringo Kid. Take it easy, Gatewood. We may need that fight before we get to the ferry. Stagecoach is set in the heart of the expansionist West with stereotypical portrayals of Apache Native Americans as bloodthirsty killers, given no dialogue or character development aside from one-dimensional terrorists. Geronimo. Geronimo? How do we know he isn't lying? No, he's a Cheyenne. They hate Apaches worse than we do. This is where the film diverts from most Westerns, focusing more on class and inequality than white supremacy. Each character represents a major segment of 1930 society. The corrupt banker stealing money, the southern gentleman's toxic nature, the doctor is a drunk, the sheriff is a pawn for the rich, the so-called prostitute turns out to have the most humanity, and the driver is low class because he is married to a Mexican woman. Savages! <laughs> That's my wife, Yakima, my squaw. Yes, but she's... She's savage. Si, senor. But it would be the everyday man, misunderstood, called an outlaw, but always does the right thing in the end that we will all remember. Stagecoach will leave behind a profound effect on cinema and ignite John Ford's Calvary films, establishing John Wayne as one of Hollywood's most profitable, recognizable, and political figures. Ford prophesizing of Wayne's future in cinema, he'll be the biggest star ever because he is the perfect everyman. Hollywood legend tells the tale Orson Welles watched Stagecoach over 40 times to prepare for Citizen Kane. Stagecoach can only be overshadowed by what can easily be considered one of the most watched films in American cinema history with a staggering 202 million movie tickets sold, which eclipses Avatar's 95 million in a time when the population of America was half of what it is today. Are you hinting, Mr. Butler, that the Yankees can lick us? No, I'm not hinting. I'm saying very plainly that the Yankees are better equipped than we. They've got factories, shipyards, coal mines, and a fleet to bottle up our harbors and starve us to death. All we've got is cotton and slaves and arrogance. Gone with the wind is based on the wildly successful 1936 novel by the same name. An almost comical, sympathetic look at the Confederate South, with disturbing white supremacy stereotypes and mythologies, such as the kind treatment of black slaves, economic equality, and women's rights in antebellum South before the Civil War. Oh, I'm sorry, Ashley, but have you forgotten what it's like without money? I found out that money is the most important thing in the world. And I don't intend ever to be without it again. I'm going to make money enough so the Yankees can never take Tara away from me. I'm going to make it the only way I know how. Produced by one of the most detail-obsessive producers in cinema history, David O. Selznick, who can be credited with the creation of hyper-realistic and authentic productions, which would be extremely popular in the later mammoth films Titanic and Saving Private Ryan. One of the most expensive films in cinema history, but still could not manage to pay talent equally. Clark Gable received a $120,000 salary for the part he did not want. As his co-star, Vivian Lee, who worked 71 more days than him, only earned $25,000. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. 
Lee also had to beat out 1,400 women who were all competitively lobbying for the part, as well as dealing with undiagnosed bipolar mental health issues. God is my witness. As God is my witness, they're not going to lick me. But the most groundbreaking aspect is not the budget, the whitewashing of history, or even the film's wild success. It is a surprising, yet groundbreaking performance of Hattie McDaniel as Mammy. Miss Scott, Miss Suelle, Miss Green, you mama's home. Acting like a wet nurse to them low-down poor white trash slatterly, instead of being here eating our supper. Cookie, they're up to fire Miss Ellen's home. Miss Ellen got no business wearing herself out. A fierce national competition to find the right performer even elicited a letter from none other than Eleanor Roosevelt, who wrote to Selznick her petition to hire her own maid, Elizabeth McDuffie, for the part. In the end, Hattie would get the lead role and be nominated as Best Supporting Actress for her part. But the racism of the time kept Hattie from attending her own premiere in Atlanta, Georgia, or even being allowed to attend the Oscars. Thankfully, Selznick bribed theater crew members to let Hattie sit in the back of the auditorium and allowed her on stage to receive the first Oscar ever given to a black performer in the history of cinema. A notable mention must be made by the phenomenal feat of character actor Thomas Mitchell, who starred in three Oscar-nominated films in one year, Gone with the Wind, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and Stagecoach. White land is the only thing in the world worth working for, worth fighting for, worth dying for, because it's the only thing that lasts. World War II would forever change the world and America. One of the last years leading up is both nostalgic, tragic, and enduring. <laughs>